It is a challenge, unprecedented in human history. To feed 22% of the world's population with only 7% of the world's cultivated land. What's the secret behind the China's successful establishment of food security? We are going to find out how the world's most populous country feeds its people. It is a huge project, far more complex and arduous than most can imagine. For thousands of years, the Chinese people have been working wonders with their diligence and wisdom. This is the Yuanyang County set deep in the Ailao Mountains of China's Yunnan province. In May, Bai Wanfu begins the year's most important task, planting rice seedlings. Bai Wanfu's ancestors moved here about 1,300 years ago. To grow more food, they terraced the wild mountain slopes. A slope that climbs 2,000 meters can be cut into 3,700 terraces at the very most. Yuanyang County has over 11,000 hectares of terraced land, an ancient Chinese mega project to provide food for the population. Bai's family work about one quarter of a hectare of rice paddies. The locals support themselves by farming, using methods which date back thousands of years. Today, China has to feed 1.38 billion people. The huge demand of food requires for new farming methods to complement the old. Four thousand kilometers away from the Hani terraces, farmers in northeastern China strive for the efficient over the picturesque. July is the busiest time of the year for farm manager Liu Bao. He oversees 33,000 hectares of rice paddies. In July, the fields need to be checked every day. As neck blast spreads quickly and is difficult to cure, the rice farmers have to take preventive measures. The best time to do this is 10 days before rice heading. For Liu Bao, this means he has just 10 days to protect his 33,000 hectares of rice from fatal disease. Uh, 
pilot Liu Guoqiu has been crop spraying for more than 20 years. Today, he will start to spray pesticides over the farm's 33,000 hectares of rice paddies. Lung Liu Guoqiu can cover 100 hectares of fields per flight and up to 3,300 hectares per day. Although aerial spraying is very efficient, farm workers still need to work as fast as possible because they are facing an unpredictable enemy. Unpredictable weather is the biggest threat to aerial spraying. If it rains within a couple of hours of spraying, the pesticides will be washed away. Strong winds can carry the spray droplets away from their target. To guarantee the right result, Liu Bao has to wait for a stable weather window. My father is 15 Liu Bao's farm is on land once known as the Great Northern Wilderness. Today, it is called the largest granary in China. Since the 1940s, more than one million people have moved here. They came with a single shared purpose, to reclaim the land and feed the nation. This is Liu Guoqiu's flight path for the operation. It will take over 300 flights to cover all 33,000 hectares. His feet will rarely touch the ground through the spraying season. This is just the life of one pilot. During the critical blast prevention period, more than 40 crop sprayers will be working the skies over the 1.3 million hectares of cultivated land. The annual harvest is enough to feed 100 million people. China's largest granary is vast, but it is only one small part of China. China encompasses a huge expanse of territory, but most of it is mountain or wilderness. Only 10% of the land is suitable for farming. China has less than one-tenth of a hectare of agricultural land per head of population. This means it has to feed 22% of the world's population with only 7% of the world's arable land. It is a challenge unprecedented in the history of mankind. The task might have seemed impossible, but for one man's invention. <laughs> Yuan Longping is known throughout China as the father of hybrid rice. It was techniques he invented to grow rice that have made such a difference to the nation's ability to feed itself. 
At the age of 87, he has come to Qingdao especially to test the characteristics of a new strain of rice. Rice is the staple food of over 800 million Chinese. In the 1960s, the average yield of rice was only 1.5 tons per hectare. In 1960, Yuan Longping, a teacher at an agricultural school in Hunan province, began working on hybrid rice technology. Fifteen years on, his work had tripled the yield per hectare to 4.5 tons. Improvement in planting techniques further increased agricultural efficiency. Yuan Longping kept on improving his hybrid rice strains, and today, the third generation of super hybrid rice can yield up to 15 tons per hectare. By 2030, the Chinese population will peak at 1.45 billion, which means China has to prepare for another 100 million mouths to feed. As China is simultaneously undergoing the world's largest move to urbanization, land is becoming an increasingly precious resource. As far as land is concerned, China has to produce maximum amount of food from what is available. Qingdao is one of China's eastern coastal cities. This was once a coastal beach, now it is a rice paddy. Unlike other rice paddies, the rice here is irrigated with desalinated seawater, and so is known as sea rice. Crops could not grow in such highly salinized soil anywhere in the world. But the Chinese have made the impossible possible. The father of hybrid rice leads the sea rice project. He has come to Qingdao to test the rice characteristics during its heading period. China has about 100 million hectares of saline alkali soil of which more than 13.3 million hectares are suitable for the cultivation of sea rice. The world has about 1 billion hectares of saline alkali soil. This Chinese technology provides a new solution to global hunger. These two and a half hectares of rice paddy may look quite ordinary, but it is in fact a miracle in agricultural production. Rice is growing in places where it had been deemed impossible. In towns and cities across the nation, the supermarkets are rarely quiet. China consumes 18,000 tons of eggs, 100,000 tons of pork, and 200,000 tons of fruit every day. Sales of food in the supermarkets reflect people's dietary structure. Vegetables always claim an important place on Chinese dining tables. It is estimated that each individual in China consumes 10 times their weight in vegetables each year. China has a population of close to 1.4 billion. The demand for vegetables is relentless and insatiable. At Yuzhong County in Gansu province, vegetable farmer Niu Shuigang is planting out cauliflowers in his field.
The area where Nyoshua Gang lives is high up and chilly. It has lots of sunshine, but the temperature range between day and night is extreme. Rainfall is less than abundant at 400 millimeters per year, but otherwise the region is ideal for growing top quality vegetables. To meet adverse geographical conditions, many irrigation projects had been built since the 1940s to boost food production. The local farmland has been irrigated by water from the Yellow River, and local growers also found a new way to grow more vegetables. The plastic film has been laid in place. The newly planted seedlings need a good watering to increase their chances of survival. When the sun rises and the evaporation increases, the soil will stay adequately moist beneath the film. When the night falls and the temperature drops, the plastic film helps keep the soil warm. This simple plastic film has changed the appearance of the entire region. In addition to the southern mountains, the arid Los Plateau to the north has also become a haven for vegetable production. Nyo Shuegang has planted his last crop of cauliflowers for the year. The baby Chinese cabbages are ready for harvest. In June, summer vegetables appear in the markets on the Lanzhou Plateau. The summer often sees vegetable shortages in southern China because of extreme weather and flooding brought on by typhoons. Southern China is then the biggest market for vegetables produced in Gansu's Yudong County. The plateau continues to supply summer vegetables until November. By November, the average temperature across northern China has already dropped to 5 degrees Celsius. Thereafter, as winter begins to set in, it becomes impractical to grow vegetables. The vegetables then have to be brought from South China to the north. Transportation increases the cost, but there is one other option. Li Tuanwei is a vegetable farmer from Shuguang City in East China. He mainly plants tomatoes. It is early May. Most tomato plants grown in northern China are still immature. Li already has ripe tomatoes because he has adopted a winter greenhouse planting technology. The greenhouse has a simple structure. The curved roof is supported by steel pipes and cement columns. Both ends are walled off with plastic film stuffed with insulating material. The temperature inside can reach 35 degrees Celsius even in winter. With the help of the greenhouses, Lee can grow vegetables three seasons a year. Of course, not all greenhouses are such simple structures. In the new intelligent greenhouse in Shouguang City, it takes only one technician to manage the whole 8,000 square meter complex. With advanced hydroponics, crops are no longer planted in the dirt. Although the greenhouse relies in high-tech solutions, there is still one vital area in which nature is required to lend a helping hand. 
。这个就是咱们的胸封，一个蜜蜂一天可以受两千朵花左右，然后整个纹饰用四强封就足够了。用雄封授粉，柿子没激素，而且那个果形比较好，闪人工。The optimum solution combines technology and nature. Today, Shouguang City has 40,000 hectares of vegetable greenhouses with an annual output of 4.5 million tons of vegetables, which supply the North Chinese market during the winter months. Human have drunk cow's milk for as long as they have had domesticated cattle. Milk is rich in calcium, vitamins, and all the amino acids required for human growth. Over the last 20 years, China's milk consumption has increased by sixfold. China is the world's fastest growing milk consumer. At Bengbu City in southeast China, 6,700 hectares of alfalfa are ready for the first harvest of the year. Alfalfa is a top quality feed for grazing animals. Once its use was restricted to highly valued horses, now it is being as fodder for another kind of animal altogether. Five kilometers away is a large modern ranch which raises more than 40,000 cows. It is the largest dairy farm in China. The fresh alfalfa will be delivered here. After being pressed and fermented, it becomes a nutritious feed, which not only provides the protein needed by a cow, but will also greatly improve its milk yield. A high-quality feed is what guarantees milk yield and the health of the cows. Equally, keeping the cows happy overall is an important factor. It may look painful, but in fact, the cows enjoy it much. Like the human fingernails, cow's hoof nails is a kind of cuticle. Our nails grow about three millimeters per month and cow's nails grow almost five millimeters every month. Great efforts are made to create a more comfortable life for the cows. After that, the cows need to go to work. The 20 meter diameter rotating milking machines are the heart of the dairy. Driven by a hydraulic pump, the giant milker can handle 80 cows at a time. The operators work efficiently around the outside of the turntable. The 
，通过管道我们再经过板环制冷，最终进入奶仓。洗完奶，它会感应，自己就把被收了。The machine completes a full rotation every 10 minutes. It can milk nearly 500 cows in an hour. The entire ranch's daily output is over 600 tons of milk. That's enough for the daily consumption of 20 million people. the numbers are rapidly changing. Statistics show that the consumption of dairy products increases by 0.8% if individual income increased by 1%. The changes are driven by a new dietary structure of the Chinese people. Like eggs, meat, and vegetables, milk has become an important part of a changing diet. With the improvement in refrigeration techniques, various types of aquatic products now appear regularly in big supermarkets. Foodstuffs that were once luxuries are becoming everyday fare. It's June, and Zheng Jiawei is about to set sail into the Gulf of Laijiu. China has a very long eastern coastline. To better conserve coastal fisheries, the four-month closed season of fishing starts at the beginning of May. With catches decreasing, the country is experimenting with new ways to cultivate seafood. Zheng Jiawei is going to install these metal cages. The 10 meter wide net cages are not used to catch fish, but to farm them. After a frame is fixed in place, the net will be attached to it. The net extends 8 meters beneath the sea surface, creating a 750 cubic meter underwater cage. When the weather is suitable, fish fry will be placed in the cage. Fish proteins have a similar composition to human proteins. It is a good way for mankind to obtain protein. China is the only country in the world which breeds more fish than catches it. In 2014, the annual output of aquatic products in China reached 69 million tons. These white-roofed coastal workshops are land-based breeding farms. Each unit has 50 tanks. Each tank is 8 meters in diameter and 8 meters in depth. It is filled with purified seawater. Liquid oxygen pumped into the water to maintain oxygen levels and provide ideal breeding conditions for the fish. Each tank can sustain over one and a half tons of fish fry. As the ocean temperature rises in June, fish fry from the land-based facilities will be released back to the sea. Wow. 
After fixing the 200 net cages, Zhang Jiawei and his crew can release the fish. Thank the cage meshes two centimeters across, which keeps the fish secure while allowing the seawater to flow through and take away the waste products. It attempts to balance natural ecology with marine aquaculture. Today, while China is able to feed its 1.4 billion people, it is also constantly looking for more nutritious and healthier foodstuffs. Innovative technologies are changing traditional farming methods. Even a minor adjustment can lead to unexpected changes for a whole industry. July is the hottest month in Korla of Xinjiang in China's far west. It is also the peak season for a variety of crop diseases and pests. Ai Haipeng and his pest control team set out again. Korla is on the vast plain south of the Tianshan Mountains. Since 2016, under China's new land policy, large tracts of arable land here are contracted to individuals, which creates benefits of scale in agricultural operations. The new production methods make new demands on agricultural services. These young men, almost all under 25, call themselves new farmers. They use unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, to spray pesticides on the crops. The drone is over a meter across and weighs 17 kilograms. It can fly just one meter above the crops. High-speed centrifugal nozzles atomize the liquid pesticide, which the airflow from the propellers then drives down onto the crops. The use of drones is becoming more and more widespread in China's agriculture as the nation's aeronautics and space industries develop. Satellite navigation technology allows many UAVs to operate autonomously and precisely. Ai Haipeng loads another canister of pesticide into the drone, and the software takes care of the rest. 
Each machine can cover four hectares of fields per hour and uses 12 liters of pesticide per hectare. This method of spraying has reduced pesticide consumption by 30%. It also greatly reduces pesticide residue on the crops and reduces overall water consumption by 90%. July is the key point in insect control. Ai Haipeng and his team literally need to work day and night. With the accuracy brought by satellite navigation, the drones are to operate smoothly, even in the dark. This UAV technology is not only applied in crop protection, but also for the confirmation of land rights and crop surveillance in general. Today, a variety of previously labor-intensive agricultural services can be booked by a phone call or the click of a mouse. These new agricultural service models are stirring a quiet new agricultural revolution. Zhang Gengyuan has a doctorate in plant breeding and genomics, focused on the application of biotechnology to improve crop breeding. In a laboratory in Shenzhen, his research team is conducting genetic tests on millet. Seed quality is crucial for plants, and each species has a unique genetic sequence, which determines the plant's characteristics. Dr. Zhang's job is to mark out these characteristics. To identify a plant's genome means to decipher its life code and growth pattern. Since the beginning of agricultural society, plant breeding has been an eternal theme. Seeds are not only the foundation of agricultural production, but also the primary element to ensure crops' quality and yield. China, however, is experiencing a crisis in its seed industry. From 2000 to 2010, imports of high-quality seeds increased by nearly fivefold. Dr. Zhang and his team are dedicated to reversing that trend through biotechnology.
这个材料好还是不好了。所以这样呢，就是上是可以预让预让育种的效率是大大提高的，是大概可以提高一百倍甚至一千倍。Genomes of two-thirds of the world's agricultural species have been deciphered in the institution where Dr. Zhang works. This means that Zhang's team has a clearer idea of how to produce better seeds. Today's breeding procedures are more accurate and controllable. This is the largest gene bank in the world with living biological samples from 300,000 plant species, millions of animals, and tens of millions of microorganisms. So this is the anti-protein cold water. This is 20 degrees. This is the main goal of the country. 说白了就是把所有的这样一些生物信息资源或者一些数据资源储存起来，对整个生物学研究、生物学产业相关的方方面面价值都极其巨大。In 2011, Dr. Zhang's team completed the sequencing of the rice genome and drew the first high-density genetic map. They have altered the leaf color of sterile millet from yellow-green to dark green, enhancing the efficiency of its photosynthesis and thereby increasing its yield by over 20%. It is the first example of where genome mapping has successfully contributed to the improvement of plant performance. It is causing a revolution in the breeding of minor crops and indicates how science and technology will change the future face of agriculture. Well, 反正之前咱制定了计划，四个猪分两半儿，各个猪场排队，烟、火一定不能带，生虫咱统一调配。This farm is in central China. The wheat harvest begins today. Hot air rising from the ground and taking moisture into the upper atmosphere threatens to bring heavy rain and thunderstorms. Du Tong and his team have two days to harvest 870 hectares of crops. And this 4th to 5th, the rain is coming from the rain. And this is the rain. It's not going to be the rain. It's not going to be the rain. It's not going to be the rain. It's going to be the rain. It's going to be the rain. It's going to be the rain. To ensure a smooth and fast running operation, the farm will use 37 large harvesters. Each harvester takes one and a half tons of grain. From previous experience, the most efficient way is to have two harvesters working the same block. The land here along the Yellow River was developed for arable use in the late 1950s. Today it provides high quality wheat and wheat seed for China's central plains. Of all the green crops in the world, wheat has the largest planted area, the highest yield, and the widest distribution. It accounts for one third of the world's total grain output. China is the world's largest wheat grower. Ninety kilometers away, 
the rain has already started falling. It is due here in 20 hours. Du Tong's team now needs to work non-stop to get the job done. <laughs> Du's team has completed their task. The parched land now is thirsty for the promised rain. However technologically advanced we've become, we are still bound by the cycle of nature. In less than a month, starting sometime in June, 24 million hectares of wheat fields will be harvested across China. They will yield over 120 million tons of wheat. The agricultural cycle continues from sowing to harvest. Crops grow and mature as the seasons come and go. China's gargantuan food supply system runs in its never-ending cycle, feeding its 1.4 billion people, balancing the 7% to 22% equation through diligence and wisdom. What drives our vehicles forward and heats our rooms in cold winters? What keeps the huge factories running ceaselessly at high speeds? It all depends on energy. Today we will take you into a new field to reveal how energy is driving the rapid development of China's economy. Please join us for the third season of China's Mega Projects.